Well, go ahead and turn in your copy of God's Word to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. We are beginning this afternoon, um, I should say restarting our uh, survey of church history. What better place to start than the book of Acts? But uh, many of you were probably with us a little over two years ago when we started going over uh, church history. Uh, Pastor Kyle was teaching on it in, uh, during our Sunday school hour, and he took us right up to the time of Constantine, so the beginning of the fourth century, and then we had the pandemic hit, um, which put a stop to that, and then after things, uh, after the church opened up again, we no longer had our Sunday school hour, so uh, we debated um, when we should, where we should pick up, if we should just continue off where we left off with Constantine, or if it would be better just to start again from the beginning. And so we, we kind of came up with a compromise. Um, what we're going to do uh, is we are going to briefly survey uh, the first 300 years of, of church history. Um, we are going to go super fast. It, it, it probably won't feel like it's going super fast because we're only doing this once a month, but trust me, it's going to go super fast. Um, and so I would encourage you, uh, as, we, as we cover these very important topics um, over the next three, four months, uh, it would be good uh, to go to our uh, sermon audio or our YouTube page. All of, the, all of our previous church history classes are up on the, on the website. Um, so avail yourself to those uh, if you want to go more in-depth to some of these topics, because we are, we are going to be just... Um, uh, doing a brief survey of the things that we've already covered, and then we're going to slow down uh, once we get to um, the time of Constantine and the Council of Nicaea. So Acts chapter 1, we want to read the first eight verses. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, uh, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Well, as we, um, as we begin our time together in these uh, lessons on church history, I thought it would be beneficial uh, to open our time with a prayer. Uh, taken from the era that we are going to be surveying. And since uh, this morning, uh, we're just going to be covering that, uh, the, the background information of church history, that intertestamental period between the Old and the New Testament, um, the prayer this morning is, uh, is taken from the prayer uh, of Azariah, uh, one of the intertestamental books. And so if you would uh, bow with me as we pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, God of our ancestors, and to be praised and highly exalted forever. And blessed is your glorious holy name, and to be highly praised and highly exalted forever. Blessed are you in the temple of your holy glory, and to be extolled and highly glorified forever. Blessed are you who look into the depths from your throne on the cherubim, and to be praised and highly exalted forever. Blessed are you on the throne of your kingdom, and to be extolled and highly exalted forever. Blessed are you in the firmament of heaven, and to be sung and glorified forever. 
Bless the Lord, all you works of the Lord. Sing praise to him and highly exalt him forever. Amen. Well, despite how you might feel about some of your high school or college courses, history is important. As human beings, we are creatures who are defined by history. Who we are and what we are is shaped by the events of our past, our past experiences, our relationships, our memories. And who we are as individuals is shaped by the history of those who came before us, our parents, our grandparents, and those who influenced them, the history of our nation, our culture, our language, and so on. Well, as crucial as history is to the shaping of who we are as individuals, so history is vital to our faith. After all, Christianity is an historical religion. History is the stage upon which God's story of redemption unfolds. Our faith is contingent on certain historical realities. The incarnation of the Son of God, His suffering and death in our place, His resurrection on the third day. If these did not happen, really, in history, then our faith is useless. History is important. It's important for our Christianity. And when we study history, we ought to do so as Christians. What do I mean? Well, we begin acknowledging that God is sovereign over human history. God is the one who, according to Ephesians 1.11, works all things after the counsel of His will. And we confess that God ordains whatsoever comes to pass. I like the way that uh, the book of Acts begins as we, uh, as we saw it. Uh, Luke refers to his previous writing, uh, talking about the gospel of Luke. And he says that in that book, he, he tells to Theophilus all those things that Jesus began to do and to teach. Implying what? That the book of Acts, the history of the early church, is Christ continuing ministry through the life of his church, through his people. That's what we were looking at when we study church history in particular. Historian Tom Wells uh, puts it this way. He says, when we study history, we are studying the activity of God. God acts in history for his own glory and for the good of his people. Well, this is true of history in general, world history, Western history, American history. It is especially true of church history. As members of Christ's church, church history is our history. It's our family history. And seeing that our faith doesn't come to us in a vacuum, but is mediated to us through a family tree of faithful men and women who labored to preserve and communicate the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Church history is worthy of our consideration. Take the advice of Martin Lloyd-Jones. He said, my contention is that the Christian should learn from history, that because he is a Christian, it is his duty to do so, and he must rouse himself to do so. Well, hopefully, I don't have to work too hard to rouse you to this study. After all, you all made it here on this Sunday afternoon after the time change. How's everyone doing, by the way? Everyone doing okay? But if you're still skeptical and you're questioning whether or not this is a good use of our time, Allow me to give you three reasons why we should study church history. First, we ought to study church history because it is commanded of us. We read, for instance, in Psalm 105, that we are to make known God's deeds. Well, you can't make something known if you yourself do not know it. 
This requires that we have studied God's acts, His deeds. We have studied church history and we know what He has done. We are to tell of all His wondrous works. We must remember the wondrous works that He has done. God does not want His works in church history to be forgotten. We see, for instance, in the Old Testament that God gives to Israel ceremonies designed to remind them of God's acts in history. The Feast of Passover, Tabernacles, Trumpets, all celebrated God's redemptive acts in history. And we also, in the church, have been given the Lord's Supper as a sacrament of historical remembrance. God often faults His covenant people for forgetting their history. Psalm 106, verse 7, uh, we read, Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. And even more explicitly, Psalm 78, verses 41 through 43, they tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. The psalmist says, they did not remember his power or the day when he redeemed them from the foe, when he performed his signs in Egypt and his marvels in the fields of Zoan. So much of our Bible is written as historical narrative. God commands his people to study history. Well, of course, here we need to make an important distinction. This command to study history applies first and foremost to that inspired history that we find in the Bible. Every other history, either secular history or church history, is at best man's attempt to piece together uh, uh, the evidence to paint a picture of the past. Therefore, we must avoid the error of assigning divine authority to extra-biblical history. Catholics, for instance, they make the mistake of giving to their interpretation of history, what they call tradition, an equal authority with the Bible. History can be helpful. History can be inspiring. We are commanded to meditate on all of God's wondrous works. But we must be careful not to elevate our studies in history to the same level of authority as God's revealed history in the scriptures. Second, we study church history because it helps to illuminate and to clarify what we believe. The theological words that we use have come down to us through the centuries of wrestling with the great truths of the Bible to understand what they mean and how they relate to one another. As we continue in our survey of the 1689, you're going to hear words like Bible, Trinity, justification, incarnation, atonement. All of these words are rich with historical meaning, definition, debate. And as the church has been faced with different errors throughout the past, it has forced us to think more clearly about what these Bible doctrines mean and what they don't mean. In this way, Christian history provides us with guardrails that helps us to delineate the bounds of orthodoxy and to help guard us from error. As we approach church history, we need to have a proper perspective. On the one hand, we don't want to be anti-historical, and we certainly live in the midst of a generation that is anti-historical. Uh, we tear down statues, we rename buildings that were named for heroes of the past who no longer measure up to the morality of our current moment. And the reality is that this anti-historical attitude has had its representation in the church far longer than we like to admit. There is this huge push to take us back to the church as it was in Acts. I mean, you read the book of Acts. They had apostles. They had prophets. 
They were working signs and wonders. Well, shouldn't we be doing the exact same things? Even in the attitude that many people have towards creeds and confessions. You've all probably heard the slogan, no creed but Christ. Well, what are these people doing? In effect, they are ignoring the ministry of the Holy Spirit who has been guiding the church into all the truth from the days of the apostles until now. As if a high Christology demands a handicapped pneumatology. We don't want to make the error of ignoring history. On the other hand, we need to avoid the opposite error of idolizing our forefathers as if they had everything figured out. We don't want to elevate any generation, not the fathers or the reformers or even the Puritans, as infallible guides. We tend to take one of these generations as a sort of golden age uh, that we are progressively falling away from, as if the task of church history is to try to get us back to what we have once lost. I don't think this view of church history is helpful, nor is it accurate. Rather, we ought to consider church history as a whole, much like our own personal growth in sanctification a gradual growth into the knowledge of the truth as we get ever closer to the day of the Lord. As we survey church history, we should see a general upward trend, growing in the truth, clarifying doctrine, refuting error. And no doubt, there are mountains and valleys. There are highs and there are lows, periods of stagnation, just like in our own personal sanctification. But as we survey church history, we should study it anticipating to see the fulfillment of Christ's promise. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. We can learn from the past. Indeed, we must learn from the past. But we must not idolize the past. The third reason. We ought to become familiar with church history because it provides us with mentors and heroes, guides to follow as they followed Christ. History ought to encourage us as we encounter the great men and women of the faith, those who have labored in teaching the word, sharing the gospel, standing firm in the face of persecution. We will meet with pastors, missionaries, martyrs, and their example should encourage us in our own walk with Christ. We'll also meet with heretics, tyrants, and apostates who should equally present us with an example, not an example to follow, but to beware lest we ourselves fall into their same errors. Well, uh, much more could be said um, about reasons why we should consider church history. But having considered these benefits and brief warnings, we want to begin our study of church history looking at the context in which the church was born. We're moving now into uh, our background phase. We worship a Jewish Messiah crucified on a Roman cross whose life and teachings were spread throughout the world in the scriptures written in the Greek language. These three historical realities, the Hebrew religion, Greek culture, and Roman government, these three collide in first century Palestine to form the soil out of which the heavenly seed of the church germinates and sprouts. As such, these Hebrew, Greek, and Roman influences are part of our DNA, part of the DNA of the church. And so we ask, how did these three influences come together in the first place? You know, you're reading your Old Testament, and you come to the end, and you see Judah there as, as a vassal state under the Persians. 
And then you turn the page to the New Testament. And now you've got a bunch of Romans running around. Well, how did that happen? Well, that's something we want to consider uh, as, we, as we think about these three uh, influences briefly this afternoon. First, we consider the Jewish background. This is probably the most obvious, and much of this background is contained in the Jewish scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. Of course, next to being the vehicle uh, through which God would bring his Messiah into the world, the greatest gift that the church has received from the Hebrew people is their scripture. And as Paul points out in Romans 15, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. The Hebrew scriptures are our scriptures. And this is all the more confirmed when we consider that the Old Testament was the Bible of the early church. The New Testament, after all, was still being written. And so when Christ and the apostles appeal to the scriptures, uh, they are referring to the Hebrew scriptures, our Old Testament. Now, the Hebrew Bible was uh, the same in content as, as our Old Testament. It contained the same 39 books as our own, but with one major exception. Their books were ordered differently. Some books were gathered together into uh, one book. The minor prophets, for instance, are usually grouped together into one book and called the Book of the Twelve. Uh, Lamentations is often added to the end of the book of Jeremiah. And it's counted as one book. Um, so if you look at the numbering between our Old Testament uh, canon and the, uh, uh, the Protestant, what we call the Protestant Old Testament canon and the Hebrew canon, you might see different numbering. Like they have 22 books or 23 books, whereas we have 39. It's because they're numbering them differently. Um, also, uh, in our Bibles, uh, we group the books of the Old Testament based mainly on subject. All right, you're reading through the Old Testament. After the five books of Moses, we have the historical books. And after the historical books, you have the poetic wisdom literature. And then after that, you have the prophets. That's, that's how our Old Testaments are ordered. The Hebrew order is a bit different. There, there are a few of us who are reading through the scriptures together this year, and uh, we are going through the Old Testament in the Hebrew order. Uh, yesterday, we finished 2 Kings, um, and this morning, we're in the book of Isaiah. So it's, it's a little bit different. They recognize three major divisions, the law, the prophets, and the writings. And... Uh, well, which books belonged in the Bible, what we call the canon of Scripture, was more or less settled by the time of Christ. So Jesus could say, for instance, in the Gospel of John, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. There is no debate over which books should or shouldn't be included in the Scripture. It's a given that everyone knows uh, what the scriptures are, because the question of canon has already been settled. The second aspect of Jewish influence uh, to consider is what we call the diaspora, or the dispersion, uh, the scattering of Jews across the world. This scattering began with the Babylonian conquest of Judah and the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 586 B.C. That's an important date. 586 B.C., the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, while some Jews remained in the Holy Land, many were taken captive into Babylon, while others fled elsewhere. We know, for instance, that certain Jews uh, fled to Egypt. And even after uh, the Persians come in, defeating the Babylonians in 539, uh, and uh, the first wave of exiles begin returning to the Promised Land the very next year, Still many people remained behind in Babylon. And by the time of the first century, every major city in the Roman Empire was home to a sizable Jewish population, which leads to the third major aspect of Jewish influence, that being uh, the synagogue. Wherever the Jews settled, being cut off from temple worship in Jerusalem, the synagogue became the focal point 
of the Jewish community. The Jews would gather every Sabbath for prayer and instruction in the scriptures. And so as Paul goes about his missionary journey, as we see in the book of Acts, almost always the first place he goes in a city is the local synagogue. And thus the Jews of the dispersion and those Gentile converts that the Jews had already made, they formed the nucleus of the newly formed church in, every, in any given city. And this explains why the structure and the worship of the synagogue influences the structure and worship of the early church. Well, having briefly considered uh, the major influences of the Jewish religion on the early church, we move next to consider Greek influence. When Alexander the Great, how many of us have heard of Alexander the Great? Probably most of us, yeah. Uh, at the age of 18, succeeded his father to the throne of Macedonia in the year 334 B.C., he quickly wraps up his father's conquest of the Greek city-states, and he turns his attention east. By the age of 30, his empire extended from the Adriatic Sea to the Indus River. Alexander was king of Macedon, hegemon of the Hellenic League, pharaoh of Egypt, king of Persia, and the self-proclaimed lord of Asia. Well, on his way to conquer Egypt, the Jews peacefully surrender to Alexander in 331 B.C. And Josephus, uh, a Jewish historian uh, living in the first century, Josephus gives us a record of this meeting. I'd like to read for you. Now, Josephus writes, Now Alexander, when he had taken Gaza, made haste to go up to Jerusalem. And when... Uh, Jadus, I might be pronouncing that wrong, the high priest, understood that Alexander was not far from the city. He went out in procession with the priest and the multitude of the citizens. The procession was venerable, and the manner of it different from that of other nations. For Alexander, when he saw the multitude at a distance in white garments, while the priest stood clothed with fine linen, and the high priest in purple and scarlet clothing, with his mitre on his head, having the golden plate whereon the name of God was engraved, he approached by himself and adored that name and first saluted the high priest. The Jews also did all together with one voice salute Alexander and encompass him about. And when he had given the high priest his right hand, the priest ran along by him and he came into, into the city. And when he went up into the temple, he offered sacrifice to God according to the high priest's direction and magnificently treated both the high priest and the priest. And when the book of Daniel was showed him, wherein Daniel declared that one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians, he supposed that himself was the person intended. And as he was then glad, he dismissed the multitude. Well, if he had read the book, rest of the book of Daniel, he probably wouldn't have been as impressed. But he was happy with that part. Wherever Alexander went, he brought Greek government, education, philosophy, art, and language with him. Uh, this process of Hellenization, the spreading of a Greek culture, thanks in large part to soldiers settling in conquered lands, this created a vast cohesion among these radically different people groups. And perhaps the most important aspect of this Greekification, Hellenization, was the gift of a universal language, the Greek language. Within a few generations, everyone at least knew Greek as it became the language of government and trade. And by the time Rome comes on the scene, this Greek had morphed into the common tongue of the Mediterranean world. This common or Koine Greek would serve as the language of the scriptures. First, the Hebrew scriptures were translated. Uh, we call it the Septuagint uh, because of the legend that 70 scholars were brought together to make it. Oftentimes you'll see uh, the Septuagint, the name abbreviated as LXX, 
Um, that's Roman numeral for 70. We all know Roman numerals, right? Because otherwise, how would we know what Super Bowl we're in? Um, but the LXX, the Septuagint. And later, the writings of the New Testament would be written in Greek as well. But the Greek language brought with it Greek ideas, Greek education, philosophy, literature. Alexander himself had been a student of a famous Greek philosopher. Does anyone know who is Alex, uh, Alexander's teacher? Anyone know? Anybody? Nobody? You were all asleep during, during history class. Aristotle. Aristotle was, was Alexander's teacher. Who is, who is Aristotle's teacher? Someone knows this. Nobody? Plato? Plato was Aristotle's teacher, and Plato's teacher was Socrates. So you have this long line of uh, philosophical um, genius coming down to Alexander. It has been said that what the law was infallibly to the Jew, a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ, philosophy was the Gentiles' fallible attempt to know the divine. In the law, God came down from heaven and spoke to men. In philosophy, men tried with all the power of their reason to ascend to God. And many Jews and later Christians were very impressed with these attempts. So impressed, in fact, that they wondered if Plato in his world travels had not come in contact with a Hebrew prophet or two. He was about a century too late, so that probably didn't happen. But it's possible that he got hold of some of the scriptures and was influenced by the scriptures. We'll never know. Uh, the church historian Everett Ferguson points out, Greek philosophy provided the vocabulary, ethical assumptions, thought world, and intellectual options with which Christian thinkers worked. Greek language and philosophy provided the medium through which the heavenly doctrine of Christ and the apostles would spread throughout the ancient world. Well, Greek philosophy, literature, and rhetoric would serve as the pillars of education in the ancient world. Paul, born a Roman citizen in the city of Tarsus, would have been the recipient of such an education. Uh, that's why when we read him about him uh, disputing with the Greeks in the city of Athens, written Acts chapter 17, right, the Areopagus. Uh, he encounters Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, and he, uh, he refutes them by appealing to their own poets, by appealing to the Greek poets. Paul would have been familiar with these Greek classics uh, as, a, as a child of Greek education. Well, Alexander's influence would long outlive Alexander. By the age of 33, he was dead. And it didn't take long for his generals to carve up his vast empire, creating many Greek kingdoms throughout the world, two most important for our purposes in studying church history, is the kingdom of Ptolemy in Egypt and the kingdom of Seleucus in Syria. Unfortunately, if you know your geography, uh, Israel is right there in the middle, caught in the crosshairs uh, as these two kingdoms fought one another for dominance. Well, the Jews enjoyed a relative peace under the Ptolemies, but when the Seleucids gained the dominance in 198 BC, the Syrians would take a very antagonistic attitude towards the Jews and their religion. After decades of suffering under tyranny, a priest named Mattathias urged a revolt against the Greeks in 167 BC. When Mattathias died, the leadership of the revolt fell to his son Judas, nicknamed the Hammer, or Maccabee, hence the Maccabean Revolt. And by the year 140 BC, the Jews gained a degree of independence that they had not known since the Babylonian captivity. Uh, they established what was called the Hasmonean dynasty, but that independence would not last 
very long because, well, enter the Romans. A squabble between the brothers Hyrcanus and Aristobulus over who should succeed their father as king leads to a civil war. I'm jumping over a a bunch of history. I hope you appreciate that. Aristobulus thought it was wise to appeal to Rome, the rising superpower in the Mediterranean, hoping that they would come in and settle the dispute. Well, when the Roman general uh, Pompey came to Judea in 63 BC, he came not as a peacemaker, but as a conqueror. In fact, uh, Pompey came to Jerusalem, uh, to uh, the temple, and he entered into the Holy of Holies. You read the Old Testament, you're not supposed to do that. Uh, The Roman historian Tacitus uh, tells us that when Pompey went into the Holy of Holies, he was surprised by what he found in there. You know what he found in the Holy of Holies? Does anyone know? Nothing. There was nothing in there. They would expect that there would be a God, right? This was God's house. God was supposed to be in there, either a statue, a stone, a marble, or what have you. It was empty. There was nobody home. Uh, and that confused the pagans. They, they weren't sure what to do with that. Well, Aristobulus, for his troubles, he's carted off to Rome, where he's uh, later uh, poisoned, executed. Hyrcanus, his brother, was installed as the high priest, but without any political power. And from then on, so 63 BC, Judea was ruled as a protectorate under the Romans. The Hasmonean kingdom was broken up into three governing regions, Judea, Samaria, and Galilee, as we find them in the New Testament. Well, the Romans brought with them what was called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, and with it comes a great deal of stability. This peace was maintained by the presence of Roman soldiers in the frontier, who, when they weren't fighting barbarian hordes, uh, served as the policing force of these newly conquered territories. And when the Roman uh, soldiers converted to Christianity, they took their new religion with them to these frontier places. Uh, We know, for instance, Britain, was Christianized very early by Roman soldiers and merchants. Well, these Roman armies would be supplied by a network of roads that made travel and trade quick and safe. You could go to Europe, and you could still find Roman roads, probably in better condition than the 99. Try as hard as they might. Paul, in his missionary journeys, would travel along these roads as he traveled from city to city, spreading the gospel. Well, the Romans were known for their syncretism, their blending together of different religions and philosophies, and they tended to be very tolerant toward the religion of conquered peoples, as long as their religion allowed space for offering sacrifice to the Roman emperor, all was well. Well, When the Romans encountered the Jews, you can imagine, they were met with a people that were fiercely, you might even say violently, monotheistic. And so to preserve the peace, Judaism was granted the status of a a legal religion. The Jews would be allowed to practice their faith undisturbed by the authorities, and in return... They would keep their inter-religious struggles at a minimum. No civil war, no stirring up strife or anything like that. They would pay their taxes and they would sacrifice on behalf of the emperor instead of sacrificing to the emperor. And that was sufficient. Christianity, as long as it remained just another Jewish sect, at least in the eyes of the Romans, It enjoyed this same freedom, but as the synagogue and the church part ways, especially after the Jewish revolt and the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, Christians would come under the suspicions of their Roman overlords. Well, drawing to a conclusion, Paul tells us 
in Galatians chapter 4, that when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. I hope in this brief survey we can see the hand of God as he is providentially preparing the world for uh, the coming of his sons, uh, his son, bringing the Jews in contact with Greek culture under Roman rule. The world was ripe for the birth of the church who would proclaim the gospel first in Judea, then Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. The first 300 years of the church would be shaped by the faithful wrestling with how, as Christians, we ought to relate to these three dominating forces. What is the relationship between the church and Israel? What use, if any, should be made of Greek philosophical ideas as we attempt to explain the gospel? How can we live faithfully under a hostile and oppressive Roman government? Well, in the months to come, we'll explore how the church addressed these issues as the faith continued to spread to the ends of the earth. And hopefully we'll see that these are still issues and relevant questions that we are dealing with, the ramifications of, even today. All right, well, um, we're going to go ahead and do a time of Q&A, I suppose. That never goes very well. So <laughs> but I guess if anyone has any questions, we've got time. We can take questions. Yes. Uh, do we, do we want to do the mic? Yeah. For the recording. Is it on? Okay, there it is. Pastor Kyle is much better at these than I am. Uh, is this on? Or? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, my question was, um, you had started the talk with um, in Acts, the signs and wonders not um, being relevant anymore, and I was just curious why that is. Well, yeah, so the point I was making there was that um, we see in our culture um, this push to go back to the time of Acts, as if we, we just ignore the, the past 1900 years of church history. Um, and I, I think that's uh, what that does. And the point I was making is that, um, that not, not that, of course, the book of Acts is God's inspired word to us, we learn from it. Um, but we don't want to treat church history. Um, as if the, the Holy Spirit was not working in the past 2,000 years of church history. That was the point I was making. Um, not, not so much a, a case for cessationism, but I've okay. made that case elsewhere. <laughs> I suppose that's a, a different talk. But. Did that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, somewhat. Okay. We, could talk, we could talk after yeah. about cessationism, but it's fine. Anyone else? Any other questions? I know six, we just covered 600 years and like, 20 minutes. <laughs> I told you we're going to be going fast. No one else? All right. Well, let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we, as we embark uh, once again on this study of church history, we're thankful, Lord, that you have uh, fulfilled the promise of your son, the Lord Jesus, that he would build his church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Father, I pray that as we continue our studies, and, uh, as we see the church grow and, and wrestle with these uh, important cultural issues, Lord, that, that they would be instructive for us, that by their example, Lord, we would, we would learn to stand firm in that faith that you have delivered once and for all to the saints. Lord, rouse us to this study of church history. Give us a love for it. Um, give us, Lord, 
uh, help us help to set before us examples of godly men and women that we can emulate, even as they emulated the Lord Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, we're done.